Hi, this is David Bernstein. I'm the founder of the Jewish Institute for Liberal Values. This is the SpeechCast, a joint venture between the Jewish Institute for Liberal Values and the Speech Project of the Jewish Journal. Welcome to this edition with Lee Jessam, who is the chair of the psychology department at Rutgers. He heads up the social perception lab, I'm sure we'll hear about. Um, and he's been an outspoken advocate for freedom of expression, uh, which we're gonna talk about as well. So Lee, thanks a lot for being with us today. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me, David. All right, so let's get right into it. Um, we are at a very, challenging ideological moment. How, how would you describe it? So it, it's really interesting because one of my favorite um, bloggers and sort of semi-public academic intellectuals is Michael Humer. Uh, he's a philosopher. S sort of libertarian-ish, I think. I, yeah, I think he said so. He, the reason I'm saying this, he has a, a recent, very recent blog titled The Cost of Suppressing Speech. Mm -hmm. And as he often does, he just made some killer points that are obviously true that I never thought about it's not that I never thought about it, that, that he crystallized a couple of points that I kind of knew, but hadn't thought about it in quite that way. When you think about authoritarianism, one thinks about, you know, uh, Soviet style communism, Maoism, the Nazis, Franco's fascists, you know, various, you know, government authoritarian regimes. And in this essay, he points out, well, we don't have that. You know, it's, it's like what we have is a massively divided country. Um, and no one group, neither the left nor the right, has, you know, dominant, you know, control over everything in the same way as in Nazi Germany or the Soviet era or Russians. But because of extreme polarization, we have divided ourselves, the country has divided itself, for the most part, there are pockets of exceptions, into bastions of left leftism and bastions of rightism. And within each bastion, people function in heavily authoritarian manners. So if you live among the left and you cross some sacred narrative that the certain elements on the left cherish, all hell can break loose. So, so for example, and, uh, and the left stuff is more salient to me because I'm an academic. I mean, I'm an academic in a north, you know, in the, the uh, urban area in the northeast. D you know, everybody here just about is on the left. Uh, certainly everybody in academia. So this is what's more salient to me. I mean, I don't hang out in rural Al Alabama or even in rural New Jersey, so, so which, which is heavily right. Um, um, so within those you know, very left um, um, sort of social and professional environments, you know, there's just so many cases where, where if some, somebody, you know, the example of crossing a narrative would have been from summer of 2020, criticizing anything having to do with the BLM protests, like the fact that they caused $2 billion worth of property damage. Like to even mention that, you know, is, 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 you know, is anathema. It's like a, it's, it's like a medieval heresy to mention that. And, and people lost jobs because they did. Hmm. Uh, they lost jobs, you know? So again, it's not, you know, people aren't being sent to gulags. They're not being sent to concentration camps. So it's not like the Nazis and it's not like the Soviets in that it's nowhere near extreme, but losing a job is a pretty serious punishment. And then there are punishments short of having jobs lost. I mean, I'm, I'm an academic. And so the currency, you know, of our success are publications, you know, it's like public, publisher parish, it's getting grants. And, you know, if that stuff gets pulled because of outrage mobs, not because it's like wrong, right? I mean, the way the scientific game works is like, you know, you could publish something that's, that's so riddled with error that it should be retracted. But what we're, what we're seeing now 
is retraction by mob. So somebody will be pissed off at some paper for like opposing DEI or, you know, saying, well, you know, affirmative action doesn't work. And then the paper gets, gets, gets retracted because the editors are spineless in the face of a mob. So that's what I mean by this sort of, I th it's that kind of thing that humor is referring to when he talks about localized versions of authoritarianism. So th mm. that I think captures the, the atmosphere actually. Mm. Now, you know, j just like in the medieval Europe, if you didn't cross the church, the, well then, you know, you could have a very happy life as, you know, whatever, an iron worker or a guild master or whatever, as long as you didn't, you know, as long as you didn't cross the wrong people. So it's the same thing, you know, if you, if you don't do anything political in psychology, if you study, you know, the neurological processes underlying shape perception, you're not going to upset anybody. You know, it, it, but it's all, but if you, you know, <laughs> if you at all address, and it's not just address, if you address um, any sort of uh, cherished political narrative that, and you can test it, and you say, well, even if the data, you know, look, the data don't really support this. My, yeah, for example, my, I'm not, and I'm not worried about this, but my, there's been a slew of empirical studies that have come out within psychology and related social sciences over the last year showing very low levels of racial discrimination on the part of individuals, right? right? I mean, it's not talking about the history of slavery and Jim Crow, and that produces inequality. And if you don't have money, well, then, you, you know, if you get caught up in the law, you don't have the resources to fight it, and you can't go to the best schools. No, no, that's not what this addresses. It addresses, you know, one-on-one -on -one individual levels of likelihood to discriminate, um, uh, you, it, some of the studies are anti-Black discrimination, but some of them are anti-Muslim discrimination of, and other kinds of visible minorities. And it, they, they consistently show, they don't show it's zero. So we're not like a perfectly egalitarian, none of these studies show that we are a perfectly egalitarian society and that everyone you know, is an angel always doing the right thing and always treating people completely equally, no matter what. It doesn't, none of it shows that. But what it shows, when I say very low levels, the, the, it's a series of studies by different labs, none of which are mine, showing that the overall, you know, they, tap, they follow these interactions. The level of um, discrimination or the probability of discrimination ranges between one and 20%. Hmm. I see. And you see, so what that means is just, just to be clear, no, it's not zero. That means the number of people or the proportion of interactions that don't involve discrimination ranges between 80 and 99 percent. <laughs> sure, sure. So, <laughs> so you talked about the, the, the ideological poles, right, and where, and where authoritarianism dominates, but obviously then there's everybody else, right? And um, a, a few weeks ago, you actually came to my rescue on Twitter. I was having a Twitter exchange with somebody who was saying, how can you prove that, there, that the ideological environment has become more restrictive of freedom of expression? And I remember you tweeted something about it and I found that tweet and I put it in there, but it wasn't really a, a strong proof point. But then um, I tagged you in the process and you came in with all kinds of research <laughs> that showed that the ideological environment is indeed becoming increasingly restrictive. And I think you wrote a piece about it in Psychology Today afterwards. Yeah. So what, what are we seeing there? What is, what is that, what are the effect of those polls on everybody else? Because if authoritarianism is just dominating the 15% on the left and the 15% on the right, why does everybody else then seem un unable to talk? Right, so, um, because just, just think about it psychologically. Or maybe they can talk. Well, I mean, there's, they, there's can versus will, right? Those aren't the same thing. You know, if, if you have, if, let's back up a little bit. People see, people who are paying attention realize that people are being denounced, publicly shamed, and sometimes sanctioned for, you know, what's plausibly described as Orwellian wrong thing, right? You, you know, it's not, you know, you're not crossing the government, but you're cross crossing powerful and influential actors within one's ecosystem, one's professional ecosystem. And it's not even necessary to cross professional actors. All you need to do is have a mob ginned up saying terrible things about you. They don't have to even be true. But if what you have are spineless administrators 
or spineless corporate executives, the easiest solution is to just get rid of you. Now the problem's gone away. And look, you know, if you're being accused of some sort of bigotry, transphobia, racism, whatever it might be, um, which are these are like the go-to accusations now, or some of the go-to accusations, then you know, from a PR standpoint of the organization, see, we're you know, we take transphobia seriously. That's why we fired David. You know, not that you're a transphobe or anything like that, but just like that's how this this, but that's how these things go. Um, so so all that a regular person needs to do is pay attention and realize, oh, if I step into this discussion and someone says I've said the wrong thing, then my livelihood may be at stake. So you know what? I, I'm just not going to go there. There's just no, I'm not going to enter this discussion. And that dynamic is important everywhere, in my opinion. It's everywhere in society. And the way society, in my opinion, the way society reaches better versus worse conclusions, although it's never guaranteed and it's never perfect. This is like a running average over the long term with large dips and you know meanderings. Sure. But in general, the way society reaches better conclusions is about with robust discussion and debate. Again, sometimes right. that can go really terribly wrong. You know, I mean, lots of right. terrible ideas have been popular for short periods of time. So I don't want to overstate. It's not like some panacea. It's not some guarantee. But that's like better than the alternative. Right. Better than everywhere else, which right. doesn't right. allow for freedom right. of expression. Right. Right. It's right. Okay. Over time. Over over time. Right. So so so. But but and that problem, even though it's a major problem society wide. It's particularly bad in what are supposedly the knowledge generating professions of which academia is supposed to be one of those. Now, it's not the only, you know, there's science going on in, in corporate contexts um, and in, certainly in, in, in technological contexts. Um, but, you know, a, a, a cab driver or, you know, a supermarket checkout person's job. I mean, there's a citizen, they have every right and should be encouraged and supported to participate in robust societal discussions about anything, but their job is not the generation of new knowledge. For academics, that's our job. That basically is our job description. Mm -hmm. And so restrictions and infringements on the ability of academics to engage in that without fear of sanction. I mean, that's what, if there's fear of sanction, there's a, uh, an infringement already, um, is a, in my opinion, a particularly you know, nasty consequence of the rise of this sort of politicized authoritarianism within local contexts. Right. So let me so let me ask you about this. You know, some of the critics that I've had of me say, you know, look, you've been a pretty powerful person. I was the head of a Jewish organization, you know, um, and here you are whining about cancel culture when you've had all the opportunity in the world to help shape the debate and discussion. Um, isn't that sort of silly? And I could, they would probably say the same about you. Here you are, chair of a major psychology department at a university. You're standing, you're saying all these supposedly heretical things, yet you <laughs> still have a platform how is that? How how is that uh, the case? Why are you standing here? Well, th there's here? you know th th there there there's like two related aspects to this. Well, I don't know. There's probably multiple related aspects to this. Let me deal with the first head on, which is the power is irrelevant to this robust discussion, free expression principle. That is. The powerful have every right to say whatever the hell they want as much as anybody else. And the idea that the powerful should somehow be restricted is, is absurd. It's a completely absurd argument. That's number one. That's number two. Um, and related to that. But they're not, they're some, they are saying that they'll say, okay, you're privileged, so you shouldn't say that. But they're also saying you do have power and you're pretending not to. Right, right. right. So the issue is not having power the issue is being able to um, express one's views and 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 th that's really the issue here right. and there have been a fair number of people in powerful positions who have lost them 
in the face of these sort of mobs. And what that does is that creates a really chilling environment, not just for other people in power, although it does, it creates it for everyone. Because, and in fact, that's my sort of my third point. The first point is that power is irrelevant. Anybody should know to say anything, whatever the hell they want. That's number one. Number, You're number not really two. powerful if you can say whatever you, if you can't say uh, yeah, if you, you want. can't say what you want. Yeah, yeah. Right. It's like, where really is the power? That's absolutely. Right. Uh, number two is that even these powerful people have been sanctioned up to and including being fired from like major positions for like having said the wrong thing. That, that's number two. But the, the most important and the most acute point is the extent to which it suppresses the powerless. Because if the powerless see the powerful being sanctioned for wrong think, the last thing somebody's going to do if they're, you know, uh, uh, looking for a job as an academic or in tech or, you know, if they're a graduate student or, you know, what looking for any really any kind of job where they could be sanctioned for expressing the wrong idea, those people are going to be terrified. And there's now good survey evidence that the levels of self-censorship in American society are at the top of the charts. It's like way higher than it's ever been. And the data go back to the McCarthy era. So, I mean, there's just very, very sort of appalling statistics there, evidence out there on, on the levels of self-censorship. I mean, it's not surprising given, you know, it, it only takes, this is the th thing, you know, kind of what some of the pushback is, oh, well, you know, the, the, the number of professors who have lost their jobs is so small, you know, there's hundreds of thousands of professors, it's only, you know, a few dozen that have been sanctioned. Well, yeah, that's, I mean, that's literally true. I mean, it's not like there's been mass firings in the academy, but I, um, and I'm pulling this number out of my ear. This number works metaphorically. It's not an actual number. But for every faculty member who is fired for expressing the wrong idea, 10,000 shut up. Mm. Because who wants to be fired? Mm. Right. Who wants to be fired? Right. Or even called a racist or right. called privileged or whatever else yeah. might be used. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So um, I want to pivot for a second. You've um, written and thought a lot about anti-Semitism. And there's been sort of a slew of anti-Semitic incidents. Most recently at Stanford, um, the head of the former head of an organization that provides clinical support for people at Stanford. Um, he's a clinical psychiatrist, uh, professor, um, Al Tutcher, I think his name is, and um, a clinical social worker named Sheila Levin were both um, involved in some anti-Semitic incidents where, um, where the DEI program there um, refused to condemn anti-Semitism, put people into white accountability groups, which might be a step up from white affinity groups. I'm not sure, white accountability groups. Um, and, there, and, and now there's some legal action being taken on their behalf. Um, I'm, you know, it seems to me that this uh, oppressed versus oppressor binary uh, is sort of rigged in a way that's likely to, to give rise to anti-Semitism in different ways and new novel forms. What is your, what is your take on this? How, what is the relationship between critical social justice ideology and a rise in anti-Semitism? Or maybe you even disagree with the whole premise. Well, no, I mean, I don't disagree with the whole premise. I pretty much agree with the whole premise. <laughs> so, so, so the, there's like scholarship on this. This goes back at least to the 90s. Um, there's a great article titled, Is the Radical Critique of Merit Anti-Semitic? This is from the 90s. And oh, this is before what they could now call critical race theory, although the ideas have been around. Um, and you can see the logic of it. The logic of it goes something like this. And it's not usually stated this starkly, uh, but I think it's really clearly implicit in a lot of the discourse that success in the United States is, is, is privilege. Like there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between success and privilege. And what is privilege? Privilege is unearned advantages. Right. That means people don't deserve their success. Right. And so Jews in the United States have been very successful. So by this logic, Jews don't deserve their success. Jews have been, ex the only way you can have success 
is by exploiting, you know, marginalized, downtrodden people. Th that's, you know, that's kind of what success is. Unless you are a member of one of those groups, then your success is to be celebrated. But, but everyone else, you know, their success is like this knee-jerk, implicit, one-to-one -one correspondence between success and privilege. And so, so if people have privilege, privilege uh, you know, or advantages or successes that they don't deserve, well, then society needs to be restructured to take it away from them because right. they don't deserve it. And, you know, that's kind of the logic of how the radical critique of merit, right? It's like, it's, it's not really that things are, I, I mean, the world is complex as certainly success is not always a function of merit and I'm not making that claim either. Um, uh, but to the extent that merit is uh, merit, that, that, that actually what you accomplish, how much you accomplish, how well you do your job, how well you, you know, uh, uh, set out some goal and then go about, uh, you know, sort of putting things in place to accomplish them, how frequently you accomplish those goals. You know, in my, in my field, it's going to be published papers, get grants, get ideas out of the public and all that's what you do in academia. But, you know, if you're in tech, you know, you're building software systems or hardware systems. Or, you know, if you're an engineer, you're building bridges and buildings and, you know, right. I mean, the, the, the thing that constitutes success is different, you know, in different, um, obviously it's very different in, in different domains, uh, but the, the idea that none of that, there's no way, no, no, there's no such thing as merit. There's no such thing as an engineer who gets paid more because they build better bridges than an engineer who gets paid less. So that, you know, all we know is that we have two different engineers, one's paid more and one paid less, that's a privilege. It's, right. I mean, now no but one says that. Doesn't no one says it that way, but that is strongly implied throughout the discourse. Right. And, and, and if you believe, as uh, Ibram X. Kendi does, that that any disparity, any failure uh, um, is prima facie evidence of discrimination, then how can you not also believe that any success is prima facie evidence of a different kind of right. favoritism? Right. And, I think, and, um, and, and the question is, are they now, are the people who believe this, and I think we've seen some examples of this, going to say, not just that everybody who succeeds is, um, is has benefited from privilege, but that particular groups like Jews and Asians who on average have succeeded are, take it, are complicit in white supremacy or some other form of favoritism. Right, right. well, you know, I, I believe, um, that so i would love to see the discrimination the stanford discrimination suit i, I, mean, I don't know whether it's a suit or a complaint i mean the, it's a complaint a, to the eeoc a, and if you yeah, want to send you all the documents yeah okay all right so uh i believe at some point there is an allegation that one of the dei people referred you know, when asked something like why are jews included in this sort of minority groups or minority affinity groups that are whose concerns are being addressed and it was the answer was because the jews run the businesses and the banks it was something like that um and it's like make my head explode this is like somebody who runs a major unit at stanford at least if i have that right so, right. so but but that you know so, so this rhetoric of privilege and the myth of meritocracy you know, easily slips into um into the left-wing version of justification for classic anti-Semitic stereotypes and 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 sort of conspiracy theories. I mean, it's just classic. Now, now, you know, okay, so let's back off a little. Jews are successful. Like if you look at Jews in America are successful. If you look at just you know income numbers or population and professions and all this sort of stuff, Jews have done well in America. That part is true. That's a far cry from the Jews run the businesses and the banks. Sure, of course. Oh, so. Right, right. And there are poor Jews, of course, many yeah, of them. Yeah. Um, so I want to, okay, switch gears again, because I, I have a, 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 a thought experiment I want to uh, bounce off of you. I'm curious to uh, your view. So, um, and it's sort of a soft defense of critical theory for one second, okay? So I'm, a, I, I'm ADHD, ADD, right? My, both my sons are ADD. We both had a very distinct experience growing up in school 
Um, mine even probably more worse than theirs, where teachers thought we were stupid. And, um, and, and, you know, I remember even my fourth grade teacher saying, you're going to be an artist when you grow up, oh, who, which simultaneously o- overestimated my artistic talents and underestimated my academic talents, right? And, um, and so, so I felt that the system was stacked against me. And I felt because I had experienced what I experienced, I had unique lived experience insight into that, that other people didn't because they don't feel it. If you're an average learner and you feel totally happy at school, you don't feel the discrimination that might exist to other people. That is sort of a core insight of critical theory. And you could apply that to race. You can apply that to a lot of other things. And that's what they're doing. Um, Is it, is that a, is that a lens that we should bring to the table among others? How do you regard that claim that I just made about, about critical theory? No, no, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, that's completely right. So, I mean, my perspective is on, on the rightness of that is probably like many of my perspectives, fairly unique, possibly the point of being odd, but about 10 years ago, um, psychology, what, what emerged in, within psychology was what's now been called the replication crisis. And out of the, and it became, yeah. it, over the next, the subsequent few years, you know, through 2015, 16, 17, it became clear that it was more than just a problem of replication, that there were suboptimal aspects to our, sort of to, to everything we were doing in psychological science, at least in certain areas, especially my area of social psychology, although not only my area, but I think it was particularly acute in my area. Um, uh, Everything from sort of how we generated ideas to to how we design methods to test them, to our samples, to measurement, to statistics and conclusions, like basically everything. The entire thing was You know, it's not like it was all definitely wrong and we could throw out everything ever done before 2010. No, that's not true, but it was kind of a mess. And it was Mm -hmm. actually, in my opinion, fairly difficult to determine because we were so non-transparent in how we went about doing this stuff. It's actually, it's not impossible, but it's fairly difficult to determine what work prior to about 2012 or 14 is good and which work isn't. It's not impossible, it can be done, that's beyond the scope of this. But because of that, that really lowered my view of how informative psych science was about people. Okay, so you have that, that piece. So the science Mm -hmm. part. Then there's the, you know, until the sort of, you know, the rhetoric around lived experience became really more popular. Um, it, it was like a go-to thing in psych science circles to dismiss individual experiences as just mere anecdotes that don't warrant being taken seriously. And I don't know if I ever felt that way. I might have 30 years ago, but with the rise of the replication crisis um, and the sort of lowering my view of the sort of the value of the science, um, it did seem to me that when you have, you know, there, there's always a risk when talking with personal experience because individuals, their, their experiences aren't random samples of the world, mm-hmm. you know? So like you can, you can say everything you can say could be true, but it could be so unique that what does this have to do with anybody right. else, right? That's one problem. People individually, and there's like, some of the areas of which there is very good psych science is that people's self-perceptions and public facing self-descriptions are are themselves subject to so many distortions and errors and biases that no one should ever take that as face value as like the fact. So that's all true. And those are reasons why these personal, personal experiences would be dismissed as mere anecdote. But when you have somebody with a ton of experience in a certain domain, and expertise relevant to understanding that experience. Then lived experience becomes a very different animal. If you wanna know how an engineer 
solve some complex but idiosyncratic problem involved in whether it's constructing a car or the a bridge or a building, you know, each building is going to be unique. There may be some general principles, but there's going to be specific problems. If you want to figure out how to do that, I, I would listen to somebody who's done that successfully a lot, even if they have zero peer reviewed scientific publications. And it's the same thing right. with being the target of an oppressive system. If you have somebody who has been around, has seen how the world operates, you know, there's always the risk that they're engaging in some sort of ax grinding or, or you, know, po you know, political agenda mm -hmm. driving. Uh, but but what they have to say is worth at is minimum at work. It's worth mm. listening to because they may well have insights into how the system functions and its dysfunctions that an out that will be invisible to an outsider. So right. I agree with that. I completely agree with that. I think that right. is an insight. And it's an important one. Right. But the difference here or is that there's a demand for deference. Um, so, right, and that demand for deference actually is probably the root of cancel culture. It says yeah. that you must defer to me because I do have this lived experience right. and this insight. You don't have it. Yeah. You can't see what I can see. So, therefore, when you speak up, you are exercising privilege of being part of the dominant class, which doesn't have the insight. And that's where the conversation ends. Yes. Yes. So, no, that's exactly right. I mean, the, the from my standpoint, nothing gets this you know, this privileged, you know, access, none of this has privileged access to truth, that everything is up for debate and discussion. So whereas, you know, psych science should be viewed skeptically, so should claims about lived experience. Each one needs to be of, you know, considered and evaluated on its merits. Mm -hmm. And, the, you know, allowing lived experience or claims of lived experience into a discussion about kind of how things work, completely reasonable on board with it. Presuming that that's the only way to get to truth and anyone who makes those claims must be put up on a pedestal, that's ridiculous. Right. So getting a little sensitive here, you know, one thing <laughs> that I've um, observed is that, you know, in the post George Floyd reckoning, a lot of organizations went out and started diversifying ways that they hadn't before, bringing in, in the case of Jewish organizations, Jews of color and all that. Um, I'm a believer that we should have nice, diverse boards and we should try to include as many people as possible. But then what I'm seeing is that once they've done that, they feel almost a a priori need to defer to the people that they brought in. Now they're sort of um, no longer free agents to have conversations. Um, it, what do we do about that dynamic? I mean, is that even is that even surmountable? Yeah, I, I you know, the, the the core problem there are not is not the rules or the laws; it's the social norms. So if you know, and I have a blog on this. It's titled How Social Norms Create a Culture of Censorship, right? So, and, and I don't really have, uh, you know, an answer to that. If, if someone is in an environment where if you say the wrong thing across the wrong people, then you're going to be punished, I, 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 you know, what, what, I mean, just thinking analytically, what can you do? You can leave, right? You can, whether it's find a new job or form a new organization or whatever it would be, so that's an option. You can try and work behind the scenes within the organization to build political support to sort of end that norm. And there are ways to do that. Sometimes you get different people elected to, you know, positions of power and authority, whether it's a corporate board or, a, uh, you know, a school board or whatever it might be. Um, and there's some cases of that. There's a great case in Canada where um, the Canadian lawyers adopted some, you know, extreme woke set of principles that overflowed into the sort of left authoritarianism. And um, uh, one Canadian lawyer 
said this is too much and worked behind the scenes and fielded I don't know, like I'm inventing the number, but it's close, like 22 or 24 candidates. This is like the equivalent, it's like the Canadian Bar Association or something like that. Some major Canadian, it's the Association of Canadian Lawyers. I mean, it's some Canadian, major Canadian law association um, and fielded like 22 or 24 candidates um, on an anti-woke platform. That you know, they didn't call it exactly that, but they said this, you know, this set of set statement and principles that we passed last year is wrong and dangerous, and we're going to throw them out. We're, you know, we're going to replace them with whatever they're going to right? So, so they ran on that platform bluntly and nearly all won. Mm. Now, yeah. so so but but there was a lot of work behind right. that behind the scenes right there you're so, seeing a lot of the anti-crt candidates for various school boards also win elections yeah, now too yeah and yeah, even, I mean, most, even in moderate places even places that are not red state yeah. dominated yeah. yeah um so um in our remaining time i want to get your strategic advice um we started a new organization the jewish institute for liberal values you've given me some insights along the way um the big question that I struggle with constantly is how to try to change this culture, the censorious culture within the Jewish community. And there's two theories of change that emerge that are sort of in, in tension with each other. The first is what I would call the energize the core school, right? Where, where you say, look, there's a lot of people out there who disagree with the culture, censorious culture they're a little. They're a little nervous. They could be coaxed out of the woodwork if we work hard enough and constantly show, you know, expose them to people like you who have, you know, have no problem speaking their minds. And eventually, that will um, that will change the incentives for people. That's that's school of thought number one. School of thought number two is that there's sort of a lot of fence sitters out there who haven't yet been convinced. They're a little nervous about this. And when you appeal too much to the core in the way that we've been doing, you actually turn them off and they say, okay, a pox on both of your houses. There's the woke and there's the anti-woke. I don't want to have anything to do with either of them. And so you don't actually move them towards you. And I don't know how to thread the needle there. Maybe there's a needle to be threaded, but I don't know how to do that. What would you do? How would you sort of deal with that strategic dilemma? Uh, you know, I, 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 you, I don't, I'm going to give you a very unsatisfying answer because it's going to be, it just depends on the situation. You know, it, it depends on what you can do in different situations. So uh, um, I'm working on two things right now and each one is that each one is different. And one is one of those things. And one is the other one of those things mm -hmm. be, because it's sort of, that's what's the path that's open. So one is a paper, we're just working on a sort of psychology review on the psychology of censorship, actually. And it was very important to me when I was first sort of brought in that this be something like a consensus paper, that it can't be just a bunch of people who the rest of the field can easily write off even if they would be wrong, but can easily write off as a bunch of right-wing nutcases. I mean, I'm not right-wing, but 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 I but I the, the people think that you know because I'm opposed left authoritarianism in the academy, so they sort of leap to that thing. So 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 um, we have so there um, we have built a collaborator list that includes people that are well known from ac across the various sort of, and taking different positions on social justice and, and free speech and all that kind of stuff. So that's the bringing in the fence sitters. That's bringing in, you know, the arranged part. On the other hand, um, I work with what is currently a small group of psychologists who um, have long, I think they would describe themselves as prioritizing truth over politics. Now, other people might describe themselves that way, but it's clear, you know, the way the professional psychology organizations have conducted themselves has been over the, gotten more and more over the last five years or so, they've treated, uh, act, conducted themselves as activist organizations where what, what matters is, you know, like changing the world, 
you know, not necessarily based on evidence. It's different if you like, you know, if you have a vaccine that works, well, yeah, you want to get that out to the world. But, but the first thing is figuring out whether the vaccine works. So, so you know, any, any sort of political action should be based on this like truth thing. So, uh, and it's possible, we're now in discussions as to whether to uh, uh, create ourselves or, or reorganize ourselves essentially as a rebellion against this activism. That is, we'd be a new, it's a possibility, this hasn't happened yet, a new organization that would completely eschew, you know, reject uh, political activism, other than defense of sort of academic freedom and free inquiry. Like that's sort of the base on which everything else would be built. Uh, and that will, that's a small core of believers for now. Um, those are the people who are gonna provide the energy to make that happen, if it's going to happen, which is not clear. But my only point of these two stories is that there, it's my lived experience on how the answer really is. It depends. It's just you need to know the conditions on the ground. Can you bring the fence sitters in? Right. It's like, I don't know. Sometimes you can. Sometimes you can't. Is it worth bringing the fence sitters in? Right. I mean, if you have to water down your efforts to such an extent that it brings the fence sitters in, is it worth watering down the efforts? I, I mean, I, that's going to be a local and personal decision in every instance. So I, that's, that's my answer. And, and also because, the other question is, is it a matter of sequencing? Is there something that you should do first? Like I, one of the arguments that I've made to myself and sometimes to others who might want to fund us uh, is our first order of business is first to get people out of the woodwork and then you can worry about the fence sitters, but you might've compromised your credibility in the meantime with yeah. those people. So it's yeah. a, it's, it's a, it's an ongoing dilemma. Um, well, I, listen, I, I really appreciate the conversation and I'd love to continue to, um, and I'm going to bring you back um, because there's a lot of complicated issues and you have a very unique uh, perspective <laughs> on them. So well, thank uh, you.